How do hyenas and leopards interact with one another when they coexist in the same area? That is the question of today's video. What we're going to cover is how we estimate population densities of organisms, how hyenas and leopards interact in the same area, and discuss issues such as kleptoparasitism and how that relates to this system. As always, all information is down in the description, and if you like what you see, give it a subscribe. Watch, do, do the things that YouTubers do. But let's just get into this. So I found this paper the other day. Uh, it's Leopard Density and Interspecific Spatio-Temporal Interactions in a Hyena-Dominated Landscape. It was published in Ecology and Evolution in October of 2022. Uh, don't worry about that title. I know it's jargon-filled. We're going to break it down. And what I, I wanted to cover in this article is that it's a very perfect example of how we estimate population densities for organisms, and it utilizes spatially explicit capture-recapture technology, uh, utilizing camera traps. So the protagonists of our story uh, are all found inside of Central Thule, inside of Botswana. So this is roughly the area. This is found in the paper as well. Again, read it if you want. It is open access, I believe. It is open access, so please read it as well. And we are specifically focusing on leopards and their interactions with two species of hyena. The spotted hyena, which I think is probably the most uh, common one, it's the one people think of, uh, as well as the brown hyena here. Uh, and the, uh, the scientific names, if you're curious, for the leopard is Panthera partis, the brown hyena is Para hyena brunea, and the spotted hyena is uh, Croc. Krakuta, Krakuta, Krakatua, Krakatua. Ultimately, the questions present in this article fall down to how can we estimate the population density of leopards and how do leopards and hyenas interact with one another? As we know, leopards are predators. They eat other animals. And hyenas also eat meat. However, the way in which they do so is often by scavenging. They tend to eat dead carcasses. And within a system, they can do something called kleptoparasitism. All this means is klepto is stealing, parasitism is a uh, parasitism, it's, it's taking resources from another. So what they will do is, say a leopard kills some type of antelope, the hyena will actually go in and steal the kill later on. And the question within this article was, how can we measure that interaction? How could we possibly measure kleptoparasitism? And the first thing they wanted to do is get how densely populated are the leopards in this area. And luckily, this goes back to some very, very old school population methodologies in estimating density. Say you want to get a population density estimate of some organism in an area. The classical way we do that is using mark recapture. And this is going to be explained very briefly. Uh, say we go out and we capture 10 different organisms, okay? So this is our first one. So we capture 10 organisms, we identify them in some way uh, to let them know that, hey, we have captured them and they are now included in the study. So then you go out a second time and then you will capture again an X amount of organisms. Typically you try to capture as much as possible. So let's say the second visit was a little bit more successful and you caught 15 organisms, okay? So let's do this like this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. But of those 15, five of them were actually captured again. So these are ones from the initial capturing, okay? Uh, and let's just say uh, time is equal to one, and this is at time two. You can do mark recapture for many, many more chances than two, but we're just going to do this one for sake of simplicity. From just this information, we can actually estimate the population size, and we do so through a very simple equation. This is not going to be a math lecture, um, but all we do is we take the number of animals from the first uh, round of captures, so we'll put it there. Then we multiply it by the amount of animals found in the second round of captures, so here is 15, and then we just simply divide that total. Uh, apologies, we're not crossing things out. Did it again, that's me. Uh, we divide that total by the number of animals that were captured on the second round 
that were present in the first round. So in this case, it's five. In doing so, we can estimate the population, so just uh, simplifying one over 50 over five, to be 30 individuals. This is very, very basic uh, capture, mark, recapture type of analysis, and the methods nowadays have evolved tremendously. Uh, and just so you know, the way you can mark individuals depends on species. I've done a lot with turtles, and you actually put little notch shells, uh, little notches into their shells. Uh, so in this study, uh, again, the study listed here, they did something slightly different. They didn't necessarily even capture any organisms. They did not capture them. They did not mark them. One of the benefits of doing studies on species like leopards is that they have unique spots. Each spot of a leopard is like a fingerprint, which you can use to identify the organism. And so the specific methodology they used was maximum likelihood spatially explicit capture recapture framework. This is a lot of jargon, do not worry. Uh, all this means is that they used a more advanced method that accounts for the actual physical space. You see, in this original method, we have nothing about the actual space that the organisms exist in. We just had the number we caught the first time and the number of organisms we caught the second time to get this calculation. So what spatially explicit mark recapture analysis do? Um, I love this research, by the way. This is one of my favorite methodologies. Uh, let's say we have some study area here, okay? Uh, there's also a really fantastic overview of this in the in the description. And within this area, we set up a grid of camera traps, okay? So let's set up ones just here. We're not going to do too many points here. Uh, this methodology is very data hungry, and the more cameras you add, the more points you add, the, uh, the more difficult it is for the software to analyze it. Okay, and so with this methodology, what you're going to do is you're going to jointly estimate two parameters, okay? The first one is based on the actual individuals, okay? What it will estimate is the total activity area of a particular individual within the population and where it is most likely to occur. So let's say we have some jaguar. Uh, oopsies, let's see here. Let's say, because in this case, they only estimated population densities for jaguars, not for the other species. Uh, sorry, leopards. I'm used to working with jaguars. Um, leopards. So uh, the leopards in this case, because we are on a different continent, let's say it was found here uh, and it was recorded on this camera trap right here. Okay, uh, so this one right here. And maybe over the course of the study, it was also captured on this camera trap as well as this camera trap here. Okay. What you could then do using this analysis is estimate where this species is likely to occur. And you use that by using all of the camera trap data. So say it is found uh, in the center of its activity might be right here. Let's just say, let's assume it's the center of these three camera traps. Then you could use a probability function to determine where around the study area it could exist. Uh, now, many methodologies actually go beyond the study area, and we'll indicate that here by going outside of the uh, red box. Um, actually, let's make this uh, blue for the sake of comparison. Uh, so it's going to estimate the activity range of one particular individual uh, in the population, so the home range. Then you can take this estimate for many species, right? Uh, for not many species, many individuals. So maybe another one is here, another one is here, uh, and you can use very similar functions uh, to that equation that we did up here to then estimate the actual population density and the population size. Um, sorry, not population size, just population density. You can use that to estimate the actual population density. So in this study, uh, again, we get two metrics from spatially explicit capture, mark, recapture, and they did this in R, by the way. It's, it's very easy. There's a package, S-E-C-R. And <laughs> what they ultimately found was that this area had a population density of uh, boo, 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 uh, 12.7 leopards per 100 square kilometers. Um, so this is a fantastic way. They identified a total of uh, 88 different independent leopard captures, so 88 photos of the leopards, um, and they identified 20 different leopards, so 7 males, 13 females. 
And from there, this is the basics of just how they captured this information. But they went one step further, because these camera traps, of course, captured much more than just leopards. Uh, they also captured hyenas, they captured, uh, I believe it was 22 different mammal species. What they did was a method called time event analysis. Basically, they're looking to see if some event has any bearing on a secondary event and in what time frame that occurs. So let's give the example of, in this case, the initial event is a leopard sighting. Uh, so some game camera detects some leopard at some point, right? So let's just say that green game camera detected this leopard, right? Then they will look for other events around this same camera. In this case, what they're looking for is the hyena. We'll use, we'll use the spotted hyena. I like them. Um, we'll use this spotted hyena. There we go. Oh, this software is new to me. Apologies. Um, what they did was they took this hyena and then they found that at some point in time, this hyena was also detected on this camera trap. And then what you do is you create a null model of events. So this goes to some pretty fundamentals of comparing science. So a null model is essentially what you expect when nothing is occurring, uh, or uh, what you expect at complete randomness. So in this case, they are looking at when do hyenas show up on the game cameras in relation to when the leopards show up on the game cameras, okay? If this was completely random, if this was 100% a random process, right? Let's say that, uh, let me make sure I'm setting this up. So this will be on the x-axis, the time of these events. And on the y-axis is the number of times these events were recorded. Uh, the actual math is a little bit more complicated, but we'll go with this. So say this first leopard, you find it at time, at this time right here. Um, apologies. So this is the center time, okay? We'll just say this is time is equal to zero. And as time goes on, what you can find is that leper or hyenas would show up at either before that time or after that time, right? If things were truly random, if the leopards had no bearing on the hyena activity and vice versa, if the hyenas had no bearing on the leopard activity and all, all other variables were just ignored uh, or not present, we would expect to be, there to be a straight line, right? Uh, you would expect the same number of hyenas to show up at time uh, t equals negative five as you would at time zero, as you would at time uh, t equals 10, right? So basically, you'd expect it to be random, completely random. The leopard has no bearing on the hyenas. But if there was an effect, this is the alternative hypothesis, right? Uh, null hypothesis being nothing is happening or what you'd expect at random, while the alternative is what you'd expect if things weren't random. Now, in this framework, so we'll draw this exact same graph. Let's, uh, let's just make this a little bit easier. Uh, let's draw this exact same figure, but instead, so again, leopards are found at some time equal zero. Where do the hyenas show up? Uh, you can get many different patterns here. It could be that the hyenas show up uh, right before the leopards and uh, they really don't show up afterwards. Maybe the, the leopards scare them off. Um, you could have another situation where the hyenas are in super high abundances before the leopards and then it just drops down while the leopards are around and then goes right back up. I'm drawing right through the leopard here. Um, essentially what I'm getting at is that you can have many different scenarios present. So. What did the authors find? What the authors found is that leopards and hyenas have roughly the same activity times, largely being around crepuscular, meaning sunrise, sunset, uh, with very low activity during the daytime. That is shown here, uh, where density of when they're actually existing in the area, when they're actually active, um, you find that they're not really that active around noon, but then there's a sharp up increase, increase in their activity uh, around 6 p.m., uh, which then peters out and then gets a little bit higher during the nighttime. And then again, there's another peak at around 5 or 6 a.m. before it ultimately drops down. And this seems to be true of the leopards, of the brown hyenas, as well as the spotted hyenas, where their activity levels are generally pretty low during the day. 
This figure, on the other hand, actually tells us how hyenas are affected by the leopards. And it's similar to these graphs that we drew earlier, where on the x-axis you have the time uh, before and after a leopard was detected on the cameras. They go up to 48 hours in either direction. And they even split it into dry season and wet season. Uh, on the y-axis is the uh, detection probability. Um, so. What we find here is that red dots mean significant differences. Again, if we're looking at a null hypothesis, uh, no significant difference would be pretty much random. But you will find that, generally speaking, the detection probability increases as we get closer to the center of that figure. Uh, in, in essence, what we're saying is that detection probability, if we look at it, let's, let's redraw this figure over here. Um, what we are saying is that if you have some detection probability and right here, right here in the center is when that leopard was found on the cameras, the hyenas generally, generally speaking, are found more often. They have a higher probability of detection when the leopard is around as well. The thought is that they are found, uh, the leopards are hunting when they are most often found on the game cameras, and the hyenas are showing up around when the leopards are showing up as well. Okay. Now, they technically have the same food source, but again, the methodology in which they acquire their food source is different. The leopards actually go out and they kill the prey, while the hyenas steal the carcasses of the prey. So the logic behind uh, this paper, again, showing it here with the red dots, there's a higher detection probability at closer to t equals zero, uh, and it peters off uh, when time gets too far away from the leopards. Um, and the hyenas are there. And this is an example of kleptoparasitism. We talked about that at the start, where the hyenas will steal food from another organism. And we do know that the hyenas and kleptoparasitism can affect the fitness or the health of these organisms, of these leopards. Uh, it has been shown that the do 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 uh, that one hyenas, both hyena species are known to be kleptoparasites from the leopards. They are known to to take uh, prey from the leopards. And we also know that kleptoparasitism negatively affects the fitness of female leopards. And I just thought this was a really fantastic paper. It was relatively simple uh, in, in the best possible way. Uh, there was a lot of effort being done. The methods are pretty clear and understandable if, you, if you're used to this methodology. And there was just a couple other notes I, I wanted to say here. Uh, this area has one of the highest densities of leopards, and part of that is because there is very little human impact. Uh, there's not as much, I, I believe it's, uh, yeah, they, they, they refer to it as human-driven mortality. Uh, so this can be like revenge killing, uh, say a, a leopard kills a, a, a cow, uh, for example, like a farmer's cow. Uh, they may go out and kill the leopards to save the cows. This is found all over the world. Um, but there's also very low lion density. So the leopards are really only competing with those hyenas and not so much with other lions. Um, uh, leopards are known to have some behavioral cues to fight kleptoparasitism. That's actually why they will cache uh, the, the, the prey inside of a tree, store it for later, makes it a lot more difficult for a hyena to get that prey source. Um, but yeah, this was just a really fascinating paper that I wanted to share with you, and it got me the opportunity to introduce some really cool population stuff. So uh, yeah, if you watch this far, you're cool as hell. Uh, follow, subscribe, all that fun stuff. Do all the things that YouTubers say to do, and uh, have a nice day.